Hello everyone, welcome back to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Thank you so much for joining me today. And today I'm quite excited. I've got a very, very special guest. I will be speaking with Chris Ferretti, who's a comedian, an actor. He does a lot of different work. So Chris and I have a friend in common, but we'll talk about that later. Chris is a New Jersey native. He went to the University of Rhode Island and he earned a business degree, but he also got a master's at the actor studio at Pace University. And Chris's stand-up work, he's worked throughout the tri-state area, but he's also just shot his very first comedy special. It's called Loaded for Lunacy. I love that name. He filmed it at Don't Tell Mama in New York City. And it is now on his YouTube channel. So the link will be in the show notes. It's fantastic. I've watched it. Chris is a master at stand-up, but also at voiceover and impressions. He does an amazing impression, which you're in a treat for. He gives us an impression in our interview. And I I can tell you it's just uncanny. (laughs) I won't spoil it, but it's amazing. Chris is also a playwright, so he's written and produced uh, lots of different works. One at Comedy, The Session, which had its off-Broadway debut at the Theatre at St. Clement's. And his other work includes Between a Rock and a Port Authority. Don't forget to tip your server. He's got some very personal experiences with all that. And as an actor, he starred in several theatrical shows, including off-off Broadway performances and an off-off Broadway production of All About Walken, the impersonators of Christopher Walken. And lots of different works. So all the links will be in the show notes. And Chris has a Fiverr account, a Fiverr business where he does offer his services. Uh, But what's really exciting is as an author, he and his wife, Julie, have recently penned a book celebrating his beloved aunt uh, and her wisdom entitled, well, Go Expletive in a Hat. Wise words, vulgar expressions, and a little bit of advice from the one and only Auntie Ro. It's fantastic. 100% of the book's proceeds go to St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, which is uh, Aunt Rose, Auntie Ro's favorite charity. And Chris is also an animal lover. So lots of really good stuff there. You know, I like to speak to people who are in tuned, who have what I believe special gifts, uh, creative gifts. I tend to speak to a lot of very creative people. And comedy is one area whereby I think it's it's not overlooked, but it's certainly, I don't think it gets the credit it deserves for healing. I always mention Norman Cousins, who healed himself well. And, you know, very ill man, but he watched loads of comedy specials and loads of comedy shows and got better and better. And laughter, I believe, is a medicine. It's a healing property that we have within ourselves because it changes our body chemistry. It changes our mood. It can change the way your brain functions and works. It certainly helps with the frontal lobe and it certainly helps with your energy overall. You know how you feel once you've had a really good belly laugh or once somebody has told you a really good joke. Um, And so different jokes come to mind. You know when you've got a really good joke, you can't wait to tell other people. And that's a bit like what comics go through. They write a good joke and they cannot wait to get on stage and let everybody have it you know, share it with the world. And Chris explains this to me in in our interview. He drops a lot of knowledge about what it's like to stand on a stage and be that vulnerable. You know, I mean, he does it as a profession. And I was very curious about how you do that. How do you do that? So Chris gives us some insights into that. And before I go into the interview, just to say, Chris and I have a mutual friend who recently passed away, and that's how we connected. I have connected to 
with other people for this friend's sense. So I'm really doing this interview in his honor, in Norman's honor. So it's interesting that our friend is called Norman, and I often talk about Norman Cousins. Our friend Norman was not a comedian, but he was as such. And Norman and I spent a lot of time together in London. Uh, he then moved to Paris. He became a, a very successful shoe designer in Japan. And then I think uh, the, you know, all fashion uh, designers are backed. And I think his backer, uh, there were some issues there in Japan. The backer moved somewhere else. And so Norman, uh, Norman's line uh, stopped. But he had a change in his life anyway. So he moved to New York. He's a Californian, but he moved to New York. Well, we had a lot in common and we had a really good time. We used to hang out a lot in London. And Chris just gives me some great stories. Not all of them are in the interview, I'm afraid, because, you know, they're personal. But this episode is dedicated to our mutual friend, Norman. And I believe he brought this together. And, you know, I'm a medium, so I do believe that. And Chris is a fantastic man, fantastic comedian, a wonderful person overall. And I'm really pleased to bring you this episode today. So without further ado, let's welcome Chris to the podcast. Chris, nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you and James for uh, for having me. Well, we're, we're, we're happy to. And then we're going to talk about how I know you as well a little bit later. But I want to start out talking about your, your career. I know that everybody has a journey. You know, mm. they all talk about the journey. I wish there was right. another word for it. But I wonder, how did you get to where you are right now? What drew you towards your work? Because you're a comedian, you're an author, you're a playwright as well. You're a voiceover artist, you're a philanthropist, lots of different hats. How did you get there? I mean, when you say it like that, it just sounds so great. Uh, I, I, uh, it is. I, Oh, well, no, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I think for me, just, I, it kind of all started. Uh, I think there's something inside of you as a creative, no matter what it is, there's something inside of you. And it's as if like, you, you feel like uh, there's music inside of you that you want to sing. And it's just a way in which you want to express yourself. So um, I, I think with it, all these different ways are just facets and way you you express yourself, whether it's as a writer or as a voiceover artist and, you know, um, whether you're an author or, you know, whether you're, you dance or sing. I don't dance or sing, don't worry. You know, I, <laughs> you're not going to have to worry about that. But um, it's way in whatever whatever way you express yourself. So um, I, I, I wish that I could say that there was like a clear line trajectory of like where it all started, but I guess I had a guess. Um, my dad was a psychiatrist in Jersey City mm. and my mom was his patient and that's how they met. Oh. So like that right there, <laughs> um, I don't know how it is in London, but in the United States, you typically don't date your patients. Uh, right. Yeah. So, um, it, so it kind of like all started there. And, uh, as just as a kid kind of growing up, um, one of the things I talk about on stage is like this right here, this is evidence of malpractice, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. But yeah. were you, were you funny at school? Uh, you know, did you put on plays? Sure. So I think, you know, I, growing up in Bayonne, New Jersey, um, I don't think you realize that you're funny until like maybe later on. It's just like, as a, especially as a, a young man, like it's just the way you look at the world. Like you just, you see the world as really funny, but other people might look at you. Like, for example, I remember the guy that came in that was a substitute teacher one day. And I looked at one of the, the students next to me. I was like, wow, you know, he kind of looks like a swollen Nicolas Cage. And like, you know, the guy next to me was like, yeah, you're weird. You're a weird kid. So it's like, you don't realize that you're funny until like kind of like later on because other people just might look at you like you're odd. But uh, I think that, especially when you're young, in a lot of ways, I think comedy is a defense mechanism. 
you know, um, growing up in a, uh, you know, uh, in a kind of a chaotic household, like my mom and dad had gotten divorced. And, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of my impersonations and my voices, a lot of that stuff came because I was always trying to make my dad smile and my mom smile. And the best way to do that, I would, I would do an impersonation of my mother to my father. And that was like the only thing to make him laugh. And then I would do an impersonation of my father to my mother. And that seemed to be like the only thing that made her laugh. And then like, as time went on, I found like, if I can impersonate the fifth period teacher to the grammar school bully, he was less inclined to put me through a wall during lunch. So you know, like, uh, you, you learn early on, like it's a, it's a way of, uh, of seeing the world. Like you just see the world as funny. I think comedians themselves, even though they come across as, you know, a lot of them come across as very brash and, you know, um, very thick skinned. I think that's the, kind of the persona. I think underneath it, I think comedians are actually very, 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 very sensitive, extremely sensitive. And because of that, they're wounded so many times. And because of that, that constantly being wounded, it's like you grow this thick skin. And then because of that, you, you see this world in this kind of chaotic way. And you, and part of a coping mechanism to get through this world where you're constantly hurt is to see this world as funny. So it becomes like this defense mechanism. So like somebody else, like that same teacher, they come in like, Oh, this guy just came in. He's our substitute teacher where it's like, Maybe a comedian might look at that like, wow, this guy, he looks like a swollen Nicolas Cage. And you know what I mean? Like we're, we're both looking at the same thing, but we have completely different points of view on it, you know? So it, it comes from there. I think a lot of it is like a defense mechanism, you know? Definitely, yeah. And, you know, it reminds me of something Salvador Dali said about artists. He was talking about like a true artist is the one who's not necessarily inspired, but who who inspires others. And when you yeah. talk about that incident, that may have inspired that that other kid to kind of see things a little bit differently. Um, well, he's in jail now, so we'll, hopefully. Oh dear. Okay. No, well, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I was going to say, well, he was inspired then. He was inspired in the wrong in the wrong ways, but he was inspired. Um, yeah, but you know, you never know. You never know how how it might affect somebody. You never know how your words might affect someone. Absolutely. You know. Yeah, but you bring up a good point. So when we look at comedians, um, we often look at, I mean, I look at people like um, Spike Milligan, um, Peter Sellers, uh, Robin Williams, yeah, um, people like that, Red Fox. Sure. I, I look at how their comedy, I like people like Stephen Wright, I like the deadpan, yeah. very dark, Ricky Gervais, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen. But these people take life, they appear to just take life and make the world a stage. They literally interpret, when I listen to their material, what they see other people doing or perhaps the way they view their life. Is that the case? Do you think that life is pretty much a stage and we're just all players in it? I think, uh, I mean, the way that I try to approach it is I, I try to I try to be a lighthouse for madness, you know. So it's just like you you just kind of want report back on the craziness of the world, yes. and uh, you know what I mean. Like you're just the lighthouse, and like you, um, you you wake up every morning and you look out, and it's always replenishing. You know, it's it's like a gold mine that just it, you can never ever deplete it. Like every day, it just repopulates with more crazy. And so, your job is in a lot of ways to kind of point out these crazy connections to to things, because some people, you know, they may just kind of glance by it, and you don't realize, like, oh wow, that that is a crazy thing. Now that you pointed it, you know what that thing and that thing isn't that so funny? They're connected. That's funny. So it's like you know, that's kind of your job. For us, I guess, as comedians, it's so overt. Like, we clearly see it. Whereas other people are like, oh, I never really thought about it like that. So in a lot of ways, it's its own language. Yes, that's a really good way to put it. But what you're saying, it sounds like, is you reflect back our absurdities, how absurd we actually are as yeah. human beings. Yeah. 
I love how this has turned into like a TED talk. You know, it's hilarious. <laughs> I'm sitting there like talking very serious and astute about comedy. But yeah, no, it's it's like a lot of ways you you report back to like the absurdity, you know, because in a lot of ways it's it's all so very absurd. Like, like what are we doing here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Like, you know, nobody gave us a roadmap or a blueprint for any of this stuff. We're all just trying to figuring it out as we go along, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of absurdity if you really just think about it. Definitely. Absolutely. But this is what, so let's talk about your stage presence and how, how did this develop? Do you believe that when you step on stage to do a, a, a show, I know as an actor, you're interpreting a character. Sure. But when you're doing your own show, and I think you've just written, or have you just recorded your own? Yeah, I just did my first special. Um, I, we just recorded it about three weeks ago at Don't Tell Mamas in New York City. It was awesome. It was an awesome night. Um, I would have to say it was hands down, like, the the best the crowd, the best performance I've ever had in my life. It was wonderful. I was so glad that they had recorded it. I was just... I just hoped at the end, I was like, my God, I hope he took the lens cap off. I really do. Please don't tell me at the end, like he kept the lens cap on. Um, so it was like one of those things where it was, it was just, it was really cool. It was really cool that they captured that and uh, that'll be released in actually a couple of days. They're still doing like the editing, like the, you know, they have to do the color correction, a lot of technical stuff, but that'll be done in the next couple of days and I look forward to releasing that. It's called Loaded for Lunacy and uh, it'll be up on YouTube and on my Instagram and everything. But you know, very, very cool. Fantastic. Well, I will be sure to put a link in it. So viewers, listeners out there, look in the show notes and there'll be a link to that. But congratulations. Because no, I appreciate that. It's been amazing for you. When you step on stage to do your own show, is there a character or is that you? I think it's you, but I think it's it's you that you, um, it's like you dial up the volume on that part of yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um you know, so it's you, but it's you at a much higher volume, you know, but it's still you on some level, at least for me, I, I'm speaking only for myself here. Um, you know, there are some comedians that you know, have a completely different persona on stage and then they step off, you almost don't recognize them, where it's like, it, it's such a, like, such a contrast from who they are on stage to when they get off stage. But, um, you know, for me, just the way I kind of get into it, um, and the way that feels natural for me is like you take the things that you feel and you really kind of like, how do you really feel about this? Like, how do you read what, you know, what, what about this really pisses you off, you know, or uh, it, just like, why, 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 why doesn't anyone see this? And so like, you kind of go into it from there, but it's me, but you know, it's uh you know, it's 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 me up on stage versus like you, you can't you kind of you can't have that persona because they'd lock you up. I mean, you would just you would come across as insane. Like you'd you'd look like one of the crazy people handing out pamphlets in the subway. You know, like so it's you, but it's a more dialed up version of you. Okay, that's interesting. And I didn't know that there are comedians out there who are very different. Then oh, very different. Very, very different. Completely different persona. Like they step off stage and it's like, you know, they're very quiet, you know, very introverted, M maybe would say like three or four words and they go on stage and they just come alive mm -hmm. in this really big way. And then they get off stage and, you know, they're very, you know, even on stage, they're very confident. They know exactly what they're doing. They get off stage and, you know, they're very, very quiet. Don't really say much. And, it's a completely contrast of, uh, you know, of who they are. Hmm. Yeah. But it's different. Everyone's different. Everyone's different. I was just going to ask, do you think that's because, you know, we, we're all so different, aren't we? And we yeah. It's like, there's something about it that's just, you know, it's like you, you become kind of like a lightning rod. And it's like, whatever comes through you, uh, like your, your job is just kind of to be the medium for like whatever's coming through you, you know? Right. Okay. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Um, I see. So is there improvisation? 
Yeah, of course. Like, especially the, like when, you know, the waiter or the waitress drops a glass or like, you know, there's some guy in the back who's had like 12 shots of Patron and, you know, you, you, like you, you kind of, that's the fun part. You get to address all these things or there's somebody in the front row who is, you know, really just giving you a hard time, but they're missing a tooth. You know, like, I want to know, I want to know what happened to that tooth. I mean, I know I have like this routine and everything, but we all want to know what happened to that tooth. So, you know, uh, yeah, like that's, that's one of the reasons I love stand up is that it's where writing performance and improvisation all intersect. Yeah. You know, amazing stuff. That's funny. Um, <laughs> but then I'm talking to a comedian. Okay. So, oh, now, does that feed into, Chris, your ability to do uh, impersonations? Because yeah. I know that's one of your strengths. I think it's, like I said, I think it's it's something that kind of comes through you. There are, there are things that come through me and characters that come through me that I, I couldn't even tell you where they came from. I try to be like an Ellis Island for characters, you know? <laughs> Where it's just like you're just there, you're there to welcome them, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there are characters and voices that come through. Like for whatever reason, there was a there's a voice that came through when I was talking about on stage. I was talking about the voice of God, and like uh, you know, and for whatever reason, it just kind of came through. It was really gravelly. Like all right, you know, hey, listen, I made the earth, I made it round. You know what I mean? And I I, I peppered some jerks here and there, you know, because the assholes. What can I say? The spice of earth. Am I right? Huh? Am I right? It's like, to me, that's what God sounded like. And that just kind of came through me. Um, so it's like when other people say like the voice of God, if you ever go to church and you hear that, like the voice of God in my head, I just hear, hey, hey that's great, man. They're talking about me. Isn't that great? They're talking about me again. I love it. I love these people. They're so great. You know, so it's like whatever voice comes through you, whether it's that or I, I, I don't know. I wish I had more of an explanation. Just, there's There's something in there. I can't put my finger on it but even like things like celebrities i found is that the more different a character's voice or the more different like someone's voice is than mine in a lot of ways the easier it is to impersonate mm -hmm. i actually struggle more with people who's who have more of like a banal way of speaking or whether or not they if their voice is similar to mine i actually have a harder time impersonating it than somebody who's like further away for whatever reason okay that's it but a lot of times, like I found like a way into a character or a way into like an impersonation is like you. I'll I'll get into it like the way that they laugh, like how does that person laugh? Mm -hmm. And then from there, you feel that energy of how they laugh. And then you kind of work backwards from there to because you get to you can't like the way that somebody laughs is like a fingerprint. Nobody, no two people laugh the same way. Everyone laughs differently. So you kind of get a feeling for how they laugh and you feel that energy of what it is to kind of be them, or at least your idea of what it's like to be them. And then from there that you take that energy, even if it's like 1% and you just kind of slowly inflate it until you have like a character, you know, like I remember with Trump, um, who does not laugh often, but he did laugh. There was like some awful thing that had happened and he was laughing and you know, from there, you know, you just like you get the uh, okay, this is this is how he is. This is the world that I live in. You know, I just this is Walt Disney World, and you know, all these other people. I mean, they're just there for the show. They're just there for the show. So it's like you start there, you start to have fun with it, and you start to play around with it. You know, but you never, ever, 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 no matter who it is, you never ever judge the character. That's what has what has helped me. So it's like you don't play it as like you're not commenting on it. You know what I mean? So it's like you just just let it come through you, let her rip, you know, and like I guess never ever comment on like whatever character or voice you're doing. Just just do it. Just do the damn thing, you know, without worrying about mm. is it offensive? Is it not offensive? You know, am I it's like just let her rip, like let it come through you. The minute you try to, you know, the minute you try to control it, it reminds me a lot of just like uh, you know um if you've ever been in the room with a cat you know where and it's I'm like the cat now <laughs> right so i you know i grew up with three cats so i can tell like you know as well as i was like the people that come over and they're like oh my god i love cats they're 
all of those cats are going to scatter. They want nothing to do with you. The minute that you sit down, it's the person that's like, I'm not crazy about cats. I really don't care. That, that, that Those are the ones that the cats kind of hop on your lap and they go right to you. So a lot of ways, like that's what, like the character, the impersonation. Um, there was something Christopher Walken said once um, I, that stuck with me. He said, like, getting a character is a lot like kind of getting, or just your talent. It's just, it's like getting a mouse out of, you know, like a mouse hole. Like you don't get there by banging on the wall. You, you get it going. Mm -hmm. So right. it's like you, you try to do that with your characters and like the impersonations. You really just 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 really be quiet. Let them come to you. And, you know, then they, they'll come through you. Amazing. What an, a what a fantastic and accurate impersonation of Donald Trump. That was, <laughs> if I close my eyes, I would think, oh no, he's back. He's back. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that. Well, was he's running cool. again, so we might be seeing him real soon. So we'll yeah. see what happens. Try not to think about that, but yes. So come but, on, Sha. I want you on my team, Sha. <laughs> I want to bring you on board. Look at that beautiful Sha. Got to bring you on board. You and James. Oh my God. You guys could be running my podcast. We could have a lot of fun. You even you have the inflections. You have everything, every part of it. All those roadblocks, they would all be gone if I was in charge. They would all be gone, Sha. This is what happens when I'm not around. Look at these disgusting roadblocks. <laughs> Hillary, Biden, and Bernie Sanders putting up these disgusting roadblocks. Terrible. Not on my watch. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. No, but that's incredible because I wondered, you know, at one point, all comedians were, you know, it, it seemed as if they were just doing one person, like Frank Sinatra. Everybody did Frank Sinatra. Right. Everybody did Jay Leno. Everybody did Johnny Carson. Everybody did these comedians. And I wondered, is it because they're just so iconic? Yeah, I mean, I look, I... I I'll tell you this, like, I love impersonating Trump. He's so much fun. You're very good at it. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate that. But he's he's so much fun. He's my favorite character. Because you could say anything. And, like, to me, if you've ever been, have you ever been to uh, Walt Disney World in yeah. Orlando? No, so, no, you know, L.A. Sorry, not Orlando. So I don't know if they have it in L.A., but I know in Orlando, uh, you, you can tell me, they have a big statue of like Walt Disney and he's holding hands with Mickey Mouse. Do they have that in LA? I think so. I can't remember. So it's like they have, to me, that's when I, when I went to Orlando, like when I, I saw that, it was like, that reminded me so much of Trump. Cause like that, this is really how he sees the world. He sees himself as like the Walt Disney of like this world that he's in is in his own head. And so, and it's just fun for him. It's like, you know, this is the, uh, this is the world I live in, you know, I, why would you even be upset? I'm trying to give you guys Disney World. Every day could be like Disney here. And so it's it's just fun. It's just it's so much fun playing that character cuz you could really say whatever the hell you want and it's just um if you said it with any other character or if you really if you said it as yourself, you would immediately uh, offend people. But you could just say it as Trump and it's just like in a lot of ways that's like his gift is that he says like these insane things and it's just funny. You know, we just laugh at it. It's expected. Yeah. Now, you're also a playwright. What yeah. plays have you written? You've written your own plays, haven't you? Yeah. Can you talk to us a bit about that. So, uh, like I said, it's like, you know, when you have, when you're a creative, no matter what it is, it's like you have to, you got to, you got to, you have to speak with whatever is inside of you. I think with all the hats that I wear, I would actually say is that the one that I approach all my different, every single facet of how I explore, like just any type of creativity or just present, um, you know, whatever, whatever thing is inside of me that wants to get out is as a writer, because I'll connect to my characters as a writer, I connect to, um, even as a comedian, it's like you're performing your writing even those like elements of improvisation and stuff that are there, but it's like, you're performing your writing. And I would say it's that like for being a playwright in a lot of ways, it's like, you're, you're being a court stenographer, you know, it's like you, you have these characters in your head. And for a long time, I, I would struggle with, um, and 
you know, it's like you're just staring at the screen and you're like, you're looking at the flashing cursor and you're like, what am I going to write? What am I going to write? And it can be real frustrating. And I remember I was in school and I had this professor and I, I, I had been writing stuff like short stories and stuff for a while. And um, I had this professor say, and he was a real buttoned up guy. He's like, well, you know, like, people that write short stories typically don't write plays. And I was really offended by that, you know, because I was like, you know, who are you to say to me that I can't write a play, even though I'd never written a play in my life. But, you know, and we were looking at all these different plays and uh, the class was theater history. And I remember thinking, I was like, who are you to say whether I can and can't write a play, even though he didn't know anything about me. And um, so I went home and I wrote my first play that night. And um, I never look back. And like I said, it's like you have an idea for like the characters. It's like if I could put my mother in a room and I could put myself in a room and, you know, we're at my favorite restaurant and the waiter doesn't have whatever food my mom loves. It's like I know exactly what the conversation is going to be. And so my job at this point is just kind of like lean back <laughs> And just be the court stenographer, like your God, just write down what they're saying. That's it. And then like the next day, that's kind of when you put your writer hat on, you start to edit it and like, all right, let me try to make sense of all this stuff. But like that initial process, it's a lot of just like, just let it come out of you. Get it all on the page. And um, I think one of the other, one of the other things that's helpful is no matter what mood you're in, you know, if you're depressed, if you're scared, if you're frustrated, you know, write about whatever it is you're feeling. And I've, what I'll try to do is like, if I have like a specific monologue or if there is like a, a part of the play with one of the characters who's really upset or really pissed off, I'll do the best that I can and like write whatever comes through me. But it's like, I'll wait until I get really pissed off. And when you live in New York, it doesn't take long. And you you just force yourself to like open up your laptop and it's like, geez, I'm so pissed right now. Jesus is whatever situation that happened. And then you just just write as the character, just get it all out of you. And you will you will write things in an authentic way that you could never ever write, at least for me. If I was sitting there just trying to access like my left brain, like, oh, you know, I feel like the character would say this. Well, I think he would also say that. It's like, forget about that. Who cares? It's like, just just let it come through you. Then like you can go back the next day, you cool off, you relax, you know, then you can go back like, OK, this makes sense. So, um, and then you, you go from there. You know what I mean? So it's like that all started to come out of me. And it was so much fun. It was so much fun, Charlotte. Like when you when you take something that you've written, right? And then you, cause you have an idea of it in your head. Like you see it very clearly. And then like you start to cast the actors. And finally, like you're on the other side of the table, like you're giving somebody else a job versus being the situation like hat in hand, like, you know, you know excuse me, sir, you know, could, could, could I have a job please? It would be all right if you hired me for your little production, would that be all right? You know, it's like you're on the other side of the table, like you get to give somebody else a job. And it's like maybe they're it's a new friend or somebody else you never would have met. And, you know, you get to yeah. and then, you know, you get to direct it and you get to like bring out an audience. And um, in New York City, it's a little difficult uh, to kind of get people to come out to the theater. Um, I know in London, they really give unknown playwrights a shot. Like, don't go out and like, you know, I'm going to go see a play tonight. That's it's not something you typically hear too often in New York. It's with unknown playwrights. Oh, okay. you know? That surprises me. OK. I think there was a time for it. I just think there's so much content right now and there's just so many other things going on. And especially like, you know, with London, you know, it has such a root in theater that it's um, I think it's probably more part part of your culture. Whereas, you know, especially in New York, there's just so many other things to do than, you know, when somebody comes in to New York City, you know, they they may not want to go see like a, oh, let's go see, a, let's go see an unknown playwright. This sounds interesting. Like, it's very hard to do that. Maybe there was a time and a place for it, but 
Right. You know, I, I think that, you know, when you get to put something out there, it's just so much fun to bring it to life. You know, even if there was like only 50 people in the audience that night, it's like, who gives a shit? Let's just light it up for these 50 people. And it's so cool. Like you see the thing that was in your head a year ago, whatever. And now it's just, it's alive. It's in front of you and uh, it has its own heartbeat. It's, it's, uh, it has its own life. And you know, you get to see the audience reaction and they're like, oh man, they're cracking up. That's great. I knew they would love that. I knew they would love that part. So, you know, it's 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 cool. And then like you get done with it and then you're like, oh man, I, I, got, an, I, I got an idea for another story. This would be great. Or, uh, you know, you get off the phone with one of your friends and you're like, oh man, that was, I don't know why, but that made me think about this thing. You know, let me just write, start to write this down. Just, just write, just write. Like whatever the conversation is, you're the court stenographer. Just, just let it come through you. That's it. That must be so exciting. So it's so much it, fun. Yeah, just listening to you talk about it, it's obviously very fulfilling for you um, as an artist. Yeah, it is. Because you feel like whatever thing is inside of you is like you're getting a chance to, you know, to to just let it out and let it stand on its own two feet, no matter what it is. I do think one of the frustrations is within this industry, and I think you can attest to this as well, is that a lot of people in this industry a lot of it is run by non-creatives so you have non-creative people in charge of creative people right so you have like completely two uh, two different types of people that look at the world in completely two different ways and i think a lot of people that are non-creative look at art and they use the vectors of how much money did it make yeah. how many people did it reach and that determines that art's worth which is crazy because it's like maybe your art only reached 200 people 300 people 500 people doesn't matter even if it's five people who cares it's like the way that you measure art the real measure of art is how deeply you pierce somebody's soul with what you created that's the measure of art and that's the measure of whatever it is however whether it's comedy whether it's a play whether it's singing whether it's dance doesn't matter it's like that's the vector that you use we would all love to have our work celebrated, you know, by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, that would be great. We would all love to have that financial windfall of like, wow, everyone's buying my art. And it's like, I have, you know, um, all the finances to go along with that. That's dope. That would be great. But it's like that, that doesn't take away from the measure of what you create and what you put out there. So it's like, it is a little bit frustrating because you're dealing with like a non-creative and like you'll put something out there and it's great. And you might have like a non-creative and be like, yeah, well, I only got 10,000 views. So, I mean, you know, it's not that great. It's like immediately it's dismissed right. as not being good. It just reminds me like if somebody like looked at the Sistine Chapel, like if they put it out there today, yeah, like they'd be like, yeah, well, you know, the guy painted a ceiling. Yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> what do you want me to do? I mean, I mean, it's nice. I'm not saying it's not nice. Maybe you got a couple naked people. Uh, that angel looks pretty nice. Yeah, she's nice. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, so it's like, like you you have you, you have no idea how, how your art is going to affect people. Your job, you have no control over. You have no control over how many people it's going to reach. You have no idea how popular it might be. You have no idea how much money it might generate. You have no control over that. Only thing you have control over is how good you can make it. And so your job is just to just make it as good as possible. That's all you can do. Yeah. And is there a point where you say, okay, you're ready now. You're, you're fully cooked. I release you out into the world. <laughs> um, you know, is there a point where you're, you're ready to let go? Well, you always tinker with it, you know, like you know there are especially as like a comedian like you look at something and you know because you're constantly hopefully as an artist like you're always growing it's like one of the hardest things to do as a comic is to look at something you wrote even like a year ago like, uh, or like five years ago or 10 years ago you're like, oh jeez oh, it was rough you know but at the time you thought it was like the funniest thing in the world you're like, oh jeez oh I'm talking about the subway again. Jesus, didn't I have anything else going on in my life? I keep talking about the subway. Like, whatever. But 
uh, you know, and hopefully like next year and the year after that, you're always looking back at yourself like, oh, geez, oh. you know, that's the point. That's how you know that you're growing. But exactly. in terms of like, yeah, but you like you always tinker with it, especially as a comic, like you're always like tinkering with things and always uh, it's like building a sandcastle. Like you're always trying to like, oh, let me see if I can chisel away here. Let me try to get like a window in here. Oh, wouldn't it be funny if I could get a door in here too? That would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, and the window and the door, they could connect. That would be funny. Let's connect them. So it's like, you're always kind of like tinkering with it. Right. Okay. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Pitches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body, and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. Um, I, I wanted to ask you though about, is, has there ever been a time when you thought, right, I wanted to be something else. Had you ever thought about attempting any other profession? I mean, I think it was the other way around. I, I was, I was doing all these other things when all I wanted to do was just, I just wanted to be a creative. I just wanted to have a career out of being creative. So I, I did all these other jobs. I just didn't fit in. Um, I worked in customer service, you know, I've, I've done like a, a, I was painting houses for a while, you know, I bartended, you know, worked a couple of different office jobs, like all of these things. I, I was just abysmal at all of them. It was terrible. I was the worst waiter you've ever seen in your life. Um, I remember somebody came into the restaurant once and they said, uh, could you tell me about your croutons? It's like, it's stale bread. By the very definition of what a crouton is, it's like what the chef didn't throw away last night. Um, I've had somebody came in and they said like, you know, could you tell me about the special? And I'm such an idiot. I wrote on the special <laughs> and st instead of uh, striped bass, I said it with the full confidence of like, yeah, we had stripped bass. Yeah, it's stripped. Yeah, they strip it right out of the ocean. You ever heard of strip steak? Yeah, well, they have. That's the same thing. They just the same thing with fish. It's stripped. It's stripped bass. So it's like, you know, I once. Uh, I remember I was I was working catering, and I uh, I had an entire tray of shrimp cocktail, and I just spilled it all over someone. Um, you know, I was just really bad at a lot of other jobs. So I always felt like there was this thing inside of me that wanted to get out, but, yeah, you know, um, and that was kind of the opposite. So for me, I don't know, I, I feel good. And, you know, it's, it's cool. I, I would say with like the advent of the internet is that, you know, especially things like YouTube, it's like you can kind of create your own show. You don't need to wait for somebody to call you. Like there are things that I plan to do down the road, like real soon, like as I start to go on the road and tour, I'm going to create my own, like, uh, you know, because every single city everywhere has its own like cuisine. And I would love, I love food and I love you know trying different food and stuff. So I'm going to create my own little channel about like just being a road comic, trying different food, bringing on my other comedy buddies. And like, they're going to take me out to like their favorite watering hole or their favorite burger joint or come to London. And Shaw's going to be like, oh, I want to take you to like this, this great place. They have, they have great clotted cream or uh, whatever the hell you guys eat over there, you know, but um, 
you know, so like, but that stuff would have never been possible like 10, 20 years ago where it's like you, you can kind of create your own stuff now. So. No, that's uh, brilliant. That idea is fantastic. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. I really, I just, I don't know, like I see just the idea of like going to different places, like, you know, at least in America, it's like, there's so many different parts of the United States that you can try different things. Like, like in the South, they're really known for like their delicious Southern barbecue. I don't know if you ever had the pleasure of having some yeah. American Southern barbecue. It's, in, it's incredible. It's like my favorite cuisine. Like, you know, then you can, you know, there's, there's just so many different things. So it's like, I want to be able to bring out other comics, like other comics that are from a specific area. Like we'll go to our favorite place and you know, just have fun and really trying to expose and for no other reason it's just it, to me it's just fun it's like whatever like i said like whatever comes through you it's like who cares who cares what where it lands how many people's it reach it, people it reaches who cares just just let it come through you exactly yeah you know chris when you were talking earlier about your parents i could get the funny part about how you made them laugh but i didn't hear about which one of them used to make you laugh was there a funny parent I would say my mom for sure, but um, my father would make me laugh as well, but it was really more along the lines of um, like my dad would make me laugh without even trying to make me laugh, you know, just in like in the way that he would try to outsmart people. He was one of these people that really used to think he was the smartest guy on earth and he was always being taken advantage of <laughs> and you know, it was just, I don't know, it was like a funny thing. Like he would go into the sharper image, you know, I don't know if they have something like that. And oh, I remember and, that. Right. So you remember the sharper image, you know, it was like supposed to be the future. Yeah. And, you know, my dad would walk in and, you know, like, you know, this, this is what the future is going to be like, Christopher. There's going to be vibrating chairs everywhere. Everyone's going to have vibrating chairs. This is what the future is going to be like. This is like the real life Jetsons. It's like, you know, dad, these things are $5,000 each. You know, this is a ripoff. <laughs> you know so it's like things like that would make me laugh and with my mom um you know she you know she was just such a character so um i mean there, there was like i i just remember like there are things that she would do and things that she would say and she you know she she, was, she used to smoke parliament lights and she used to drink a can of coke and like that was her character like she just everywhere she goes and like you know it becomes like a prop where it's like the cigarette is there like and let me tell you something okay Sha? let me tell you you have a beautiful beautiful bookcase behind you but the way that you're transparent and you're going back and forth i don't know if it's real so right it's like you get the idea of like the, my mom's character yeah where, yeah. you know and it's just it's very funny it's just you grow up and that is you know that's the aquarium that you swim in and you know it, it, you just you you it just it permeates inside of yourself you know sounds like it because i was going to ask you do you think creativity you're born with it or is it learned i don't know i think it might be both it might be something that's uh it, it, it's I think that it's just a way in which you express yourself because there's something inside of you. However, that thing got in there, whether you were born with it or whether something happened and that's just the way that you want to express yourself. Um, I don't know. I don't know, man. That's a, a, it's a good question. I, I have more questions than answers here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I started a podcast. I want to know from you guys. I know. I know. Yeah. I'm here, Sha. I'm going to shake that plant you got in the background. Right. So, Chris, tell us about your upcoming projects because you've got so much going on. What's happening? What's coming up? All right. So, um, I already alluded to a little bit of it. Just as, you know, in the future, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, just a completely separate show on YouTube, just going around the country as I'm touring comic, you know, just trying different you know food venues and bringing on other comics just taking taking me to like their favorite watering hole or their favorite burger joint my wife and i are also starting up a podcast within the next month uh it's going to be real people talking about real ghost stories yeah and, uh, we're going to be bringing on other people that my wife grew up in a haunted house in the bronx wonderful so the house itself was uh 
it was like pre-war it was built in the late 1800s and you know back then in the bronx in new york city it almost looked like um it looked like a western you know it was a very completely different landscape than it is today there weren't any skyscrapers it almost looked like like farmland so when uh when that house was created i mean lord knows how many dead cowboys are trapped in the walls there so uh she grew up in that house and obviously like she could you know tell you stories about like the crazy things that have happened and she's told me it's like you know like i i can't believe it like my god and you know she has all her cousins that were there that you know could verify some of the, like the crazy things that had happened in that house and i found as we started talking about this that there were other people they're like oh yeah i grew up in a haunted or like hey I, my, my uncle had an experience like this or like my mom and so we thought it'd be pretty cool to have people on to kind of talk about it and you know have a couple of laughs you know okay. so that's one of the other things we're working on and then just as a comic just you know as i release the special kind of getting out there you know going across hopefully to uh, not just the united states but make my way over to the uk you know yeah. and uh australia europe and having fun i'm studying italian right now oh and as i uh, progress I would love to, and this is down the road, I'd love to be able to like take my stand up, transcribe it to Italian and perform it in Italian to various different places in Italy. So, I mean, that's all stuff like that's down. It's going to take me a long time to get fluent in it. Um, right now it's like, hey, como stai? Uh, mi chiamo sausage. You know, it's like, I got a ways to go before I, you know, can transcribe an entire like hour stand up special. Um, and, you know, and then always, you know, with plays and things that I'm writing and things that I'm putting out there. So that's uh, all that stuff is kind of down the road. But we're very excited about the podcast. It's named, yes. um, it's called Growing Up Haunted. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. That sounds brilliant. Oh, I can't yeah. wait to listen to it as well. I love ghost stories. I like ghosts. <laughs> I don't mind. Yeah, them. I know. I was the kid who said, yeah, yeah, come on in. <laughs> Tell me what you know. really cool, though. Honestly, just, I mean, it must be very cool just to kind of have that experience as a medium yourself, just to have like, you know, where, you know, people are coming through you and, you know, you can, you're sitting there having a conversation with somebody, but maybe you're, you know, you're also speaking to this person on the other side at the same time as well. Exactly. It, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And um, it's not scary. I mean, neighbors can be scarier. You know, the kid at school can be scarier than a sure. ghost. So it's not, you know, an in-law can be scarier, you know, I mean. You know. <laughs> so that's, that, that was the thing is that I kind of got over and over again from my wife is that it wasn't so, I mean, there were certainly terrifying things that she had experienced, mm -hmm. but overall um, it just kind of became like a, like a roommate, mm -hmm. like an unseen roommate in, in this house. And uh, what I found pretty interesting is that you know where she grew up is that whatever was in that house didn't seem to because she grew up in the house as like a little girl so like whatever you know whatever was in there kind of took to like protecting her as a little girl and then as like other people came in the house other people would comment up and like the things that whatever spirits whatever you want to call it would some of them would react pretty violently mm -hmm. to other people coming in to like their space mm -hmm. and like uh it was just i don't know i i i personally when i went in there i never ever saw or experienced anything but the only thing that i could tell you is that when i went in that house i felt like i had about ten thousand pair of eyes on me mm -hmm. just looking at me mm -hmm. just staring at me the whole way it's like you know that feeling like if you close your eyes and you asked everyone to just look at you even though you couldn't see anything your eyes are closed you can still feel like what it's like to have somebody just looking at you and that's what i felt like anywhere i walk through that house mm. you just feel like a pair of eyes like the you know it's like those old movies where the painting is there and the eyes just move <laughs> <laughs> you know you feel like there's eyes on you at all times yeah. amazing it, cats are very psychic oh yeah just take a cat yeah. in there and they'll, they'll point it out but speaking of lots of eyes on you how do you walk out in front of a load of people stand up in front because it literally is stand up 
Um, it, it is literal stand. It's like me as a medium. I go places. I stand up to do. I always make a joke about. I I am standing up. I don't sit down. But you're you're standing up in front of loads of people, and then you tell jokes. Right. How do you do that? Some people can't even get up and go into work. There are there's there's something inside of you that you. Uh, you know, it's just like you, you feel something inside of you that like you really want to share this great thing. But then there's also this other part of you that's like you don't want to you. There's, it's like a constant juxtaposition between wanting to share and wanting to hide at all times. So it's like that that's that 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 is going on at you at all times. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times and I, I deal with this myself where it's like you you feel this like this this animus right before you kind of get on stage you just feel like you know all right chris five seconds okay we're gonna let you on in one minute all right one minute one minute get out on stage and it's just like you're just sitting there and you're ready to go and they're like all right listen hey listen this other comic came in so we're just gonna we're gonna bump you but we're gonna just in 10 minutes you just sit there and it's like the longest 10 minutes of your life oh my god jesus it's just this weird fight or flight that's going on inside of your body and then once you get on stage it's you know you feel the love from the audience and it's just all your instincts take over but yeah, it's like you you feel that weird feeling inside of you, You're like, like you don't want to be here. The exit's right there. I could just leave. Nobody would know. Uh, but you have this thing inside of you that you just you you feel like a loaded gun. You just you just want to let it, you know. You 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 feel like you're gonna explode unless you like let this thing out inside of you. So it's. Um, you also kind of feel like there's something inside of you, especially if you have a new joke. Like that's it's one of the reasons you kind of keep writing is you get really excited. Like, oh man, I I can't wait to hear how this lands. I can't wait to hear how this one lands. I think they're gonna like this one. I can't wait. I can't wait to tell this joke. It's like you're you always kind of have this feeling like where like this crazy thing happened at work or this crazy thing happened with your family. And like you just want to call up one of your best friends and you're like, man, you are not gonna believe what happened to me today i gotta tell you i gotta tell somebody all right do you, all right, do you have a minute do you have two minutes all right five minutes can you just give me five minutes and then like then you go from there but that's kind of the feeling you have and you always have it when you have a new joke so it's like that's one of the reasons to also kind of keep writing is because you get that excitement back when you have like the other stuff that works not that there's anything wrong with it but you just don't have that same type of level of excitement you're like okay great they're gonna love that i can't wait to tell that story i can't wait to do that joke i know they're gonna love it right but man, that joke in the middle, like at like four minutes, oh my God, I can't wait to try that. They're going to love that. Like that's where you start to get excited. So you have something to say. That's yeah, you got something to say. You have something to say. So and also you get excited, yeah. And that's why you get excited. So how do you care for yourself? What What are your self-care routines? I think just, you know, as soon as you, you know, no matter what it is, you, you, you have to kind of be happy that you're doing it you can't ever attribute to like you know i don't know how successful this is going to be i don't know how much money this is going to make you know we all have bills we all have you know an electric bill we all have a rent or a mortgage whatever you know you can't get too crazy with thinking like oh, i don't know how successful this is going to be i don't know you, you just have to really just for me what helps is you just remind yourself is that I remember how unhappy I was not doing this. So I would rather have even the worst of days doing this or how, however hard I get kicked in the nuts from like some rejection, some like thing you really hoped you were gonna get that you didn't get, which happens all the time in this industry. You just, you remember what it was like and how unhappy you were not singing whatever music was inside of you. And so once you do that, it's it's a lot easier to just kind of keep going forward. And in terms of like just taking care of yourself, it's good just to to take a moment after everything. Just you know you you know you you just realize all right this is this is what went great. Here's where it went wrong, and you just approach it in a very administrative kind of way. You don't have any type of judgment. You know I. Uh, I try to build my comedy, my plays, whatever, like a roller coaster full of words. And, you know, as you go through it, like your job is 
I mean, with stand-up comedy, it's a little different because like that's really one of the only art forms where you you're literally practicing in front of an audience versus like you know a playwright or anyone else where it's like you have the luxury of failing in your own living room you know but as a comedian it's like you have the you don't have that luxury you get to fail in front of 100 strangers or 50 strangers or whoever and it's just it's embarrassing <laughs> you know like you set out there to be funny and you fell flat on your face and then you have to kind of come back and you just the best way i have found is just to kind of have a very detached way of looking at it and being just honest like where did it go wrong like what did i not address and like you take out the wrench and you're like all right let's try to fix whatever went wrong and i know this sounds crazy but that's my dopamine release that's what makes me happy is like all right here's where it went to shit last night but here's where I think I can fix it. And then you fix it and then you go put it up again that night. You're like, ah, you see it worked. It worked. Okay, great. And then you move on to the next thing. You know, so I think is is part of the self-care, no matter what it is you're doing, is never, ever getting too attached to any particular single performance and just use it that no matter what goes wrong, you just use it as an opportunity to get better. You know, that's something that you have control over. You have control over getting better at it, you know, and then you could say, okay, here's where it went great. Here's where it went awesome. And here's where it like it died. Okay, well, let's figure out, let's pull it apart. You know what I mean? So it helps once you start to like get ahead of yourself and like, oh, it should have had this many views or, you know, I should have this many subscribers. Like once you start to go down that path, it's like, you know, you're swirling down like a sinkhole here as long as you can just focus on just it doesn't matter just create i don't know i try to remind myself of this it's like it doesn't make a difference in 100 years everyone's going to forget everything i've done anyway like for the most part like i most of the stuff you create is going to be forgotten so it's like just create really good stuff just create really 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 good stuff and you know whatever survives is whatever survives and um you know, just just try to focus on creating really good stuff. And part of the creation process of creating something that's really good, you know, you got to run into a lot of brick walls. Absolutely. If you're enjoying the show so far, here's your chance to subscribe and support the channel. Hit that like button. And also, very importantly, leave me a comment wherever you are listening or watching. Even if you just put an emoji, it lets us know that you're with us. Here's your countdown. Thanks for your support. Now back to the show. And as you say, it, you know, that one joke could lift somebody out of a depression. Let's not forget. And funny, this just came to me because we're going to talk about our mutual friend, Norman. But have you heard of Norman Cousins? Norman, I don't know. I don't know if I know Norman okay, Cousins. So Is he, he in the UK? It, no, he was a guy who actually laughed himself well. <laughs> he in okay. Yeah, he was in hospital and he was very, very unwell. If you look him up, Norman Cousins, you'll find him. He's a, he's a, but he actually watched a load of funny things and he improved his health by laughing. So it does work. And if somebody can help you with a joke, you know, we, we all look at funny films and feel better after that real belly laugh, you know, that there's nothing better than having that belly laugh, that laugh that bowls you over, you know, or brings tears to your eyes. Yeah, I, sometimes I forget about that, you know, because like whatever joke you have that you've been working on for, you know, however long, you know, to you, it's more of like this administrative thing where you're looking at it like, all right, here's where I have to tighten the bolts, you know, and then like somebody comes up to you afterwards and they'll say, you know, like, I, you know, my mom does that too. Or uh, like, uh, I don't know, like you, I remember there was an email that we, uh, it was me and Andrew Ginsberg and a bunch of other comedians. I was opening for him in Connecticut. And I remember he had gotten this email after the show from somebody, I don't know who it was, but this is recent, it was a couple of weeks ago, just talking about like how awful he had felt because he has family that's in Russia right now. And, you know, 
all the turmoil and everything that's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. And he was just so appreciative for all of the comics that came out that night and all the jokes that we had told. And it's like, you never really think about it. I don't, I don't know who the guy was. And, you know, it, it makes you feel good, you know, to know that, you know, you're, you can make somebody out there laugh like that. And you, you never know. You never know how deeply your words might pierce somebody in the best of ways where even, even if it was for an hour or two hours, it's like, or however long, it's like you're lifting somebody out of that with, you know, kind of talking about whatever you went through. Um, I don't know. Like the way I look at it, it's it's a lot like uh, Rumpelstiltskin. It's like you're taking all this shit that happened to you and you're just crocheting it together into gold. And, uh, you know, you use that to kind of keep somebody warm. So you don't know. You, you have no idea. You, but it's like the more personal that you can make it, the better. And that's to me, that's when I started having people come up to me after a show and being like, oh, yeah, my mom does that. Or like, oh, yeah, my dad's the same way. Like, you remind me so much of my brother, like whatever. It's like, but, you know, like the more personal you can be, the more that you'll you'll hit people right in the solar plexus, you know. That's that related relatability. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, laughter is therapy. But speaking of, of Norman, so uh, we have a friend in common. His name is Norman Smitherman. Uh, he was a fashion designer, well, shoe designer. So I don't know when you met Norman, um, and we were both at fashion college. And um, I was, do he was doing design, I was doing marketing. But Norman, I kind of lost contact. And then later on, he moved to Paris, then he moved to Japan. I don't know if you were aware of when he lived in Paris, then he moved to Japan. His shoe line took off. Yeah. It was really big. Um, and then unfortunately, we've recently lost him. He passed away yeah. years ago. Um, but yeah, I Norman and I used to go out all the time. We had mutual friends. So we would go to clubs and dance all night and then go out to breakfast and and then he'd call me the next day and say do you want to go out tonight I'm like, no, I have to work. <laughs> he was a party animal and so talented so funny um the life of the party yeah um so i those are my memories of norman what about you so for me i i met norman i don't know like 2000 and maybe 2004, 2005, um, we were both waiting tables at this uh, Portuguese restaurant on Hudson Street. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like he was kind of like doing something on the side, like anybody that was that was there, we were all we were all trying to do other things. And it's like the waiting the tables is just like something you do to pay the bills. And, you know, immediately, um, he and I just, you know, we, uh, we immediately struck it off. And he's just he was just a hilarious guy. And like you talk about deadpan, like he was very, very deadpan. Definitely, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, that's uh, why we got along. But was this in New York, Chris? Yeah, it was in New York. It was yeah. New York City. Okay, okay. And uh, you know, I remember, you know, he was telling me he's like, yeah, you know, I, I had a couple shoes take off in like Japan and London. I was like, really? Yeah, he did. And like he had like this big book that he showed. I was like, holy shit, that's awesome! Wow, man. So. You know, like it was just like, um, you know, like you never know, you know, for anyone else, they'd have been like, yeah, that's my colleague, Norman, you know, but um, you just never know what galaxies are inside of somebody until you like you get to talking to them and you're like, wow, holy shit. I didn't know you like you had a shoe thing that like took off like these uh, shoes that he had designed. And, you know, he was doing really, really well. And we kept in contact over the years and he was always very supportive. And he loved my Donald Trump impersonation too. He's like, oh my God, yes, you have to do that. Yes, that is too much. And, uh, you know, like it was it was a crazy thing because during COVID, you know, I was like, man, I haven't heard from him in a while. Let me go check in on him. And, you know, I called and then it didn't, he didn't pick up. And I was like, all right, let me shoot him a text message. And then I didn't hear back. And then I said, oh, he must be really busy. And then I said, well, geez, it's been a couple of months. Let me just reach out on Facebook. Maybe I see what he's up to on Facebook. And then they were like, you know, Norman had passed away. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. When the hell did this happen? So I don't know. I mean, I, with everything happening during COVID, I don't know if it was something related to that. I don't know if it was like, you know, but no matter what, he was way too young and he was way too talented, you know? And so, 
you know, it was just one of those things that, you know, you just never really knew what had happened. And I know even still for you and I, we still don't know 100% what had happened, you know. But I'm still reach out to his sister again. I, I will keep yeah. trying because she did, she did um, contact me. She said Norman had talked about me through the years a lot. So I am going to keep, um, he, he used to call us because I used, we used to, well, I used to hang out with a, a, an Irish girl called Claire and we would go everywhere. Norman would want to tag along. And he used to call, he used to think he was Robert Palmer and we were the, the dancing because we used to wear these dresses. And he used to say, right, yeah, definitely the, he used to call us something I can't, but Robert Palmer used to say, addicted to love or something. Right. Um, so he used to have all these exact deadpan jokes and, um, and yeah, I know somebody else that knows him as well. So I'm going to reach out to him. I've forgotten all about him. <laughs> but <laughs> just, just to give you credit, man, like, and this is the genesis of this entire conversation is that I had reached out to a couple of people on Norman's page. And I said, you know, listen, you know, I'm just, I was one of Norman's friends. I was just curious what had happened. You know, you were the only person that had reached out to me and you were, you were like listen I, I, i'm not sure what had happened man but i'm just getting this message now i'm just um i, I have no idea what had happened but yeah it's 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 really sad to you know and i was it was just nice because i'd written so many different people messages and nobody got back to me and you know i try to be as respectful as possible it's not like i was asking for any kind of grisly details but when you find out like a friend of yours that you haven't spoken to in a while is gone you just kind of want to know what happened um you know just to give you you know credit like you were one of the you were the only person that had reached out and had said uh you know you reached out to me and you were kind enough just to say like you, you didn't know the details either and um it you know it, it just kind of speaks to your character thank you chris that was that but norman i think that was his character too he liked to keep people connected um, he was always ringing, but it was always to go out <laughs> to have a drink. Okay. And then we would just sit and chat afterwards. You know, we come on 4 a.m. And, and just talk all night about fashion and his shoe line. And But yeah, he, he was very successful. And I think his backer in Japan, something happened. I can't remember. He did tell me. It's my memory. I think there's something. It, but that's the world of fashion. And that's kind of why I got out of it. But it's a bit fickle. Yeah. And that's what Norman would have liked. He loved oh, yeah. very outspoken yeah. and as you know, very outspoken. <laughs> yeah, he'll tell you. He'll tell you straight away. Like he, you know, if he didn't like you or you know, whatever, like or you know, if he liked something or didn't like it, you know. I remember he's just he was just such a character, man. He really was. He was just such a character. So Indeed. yeah, I I do miss him. I miss him. And yeah, any but I'm I'm glad we were able, it's so nice to speak about to be able to yeah. speak about him um yeah so i hold him we can hold him close and he probably helped to set all this up so yeah i know he did i know I'm he thinking did. of you um he knows <laughs> he knows <laughs> oh, now before you go i just want to ask as well about your philanthropy because you and your lovely wife support um a couple of I, I don't know if they're in the UK, but there are a couple of organizations. So one is to do with pets. Right. So you want to tell us about that? All right. So this all kind of started with um, a book that my wife and I had kind of put together. And this was this was about um, my aunt's, my, you know, my wife's aunt. Her name was Rose Castaldo, and she was like the Yogi Berra of the Bronx. Like, and she she was just like the female Yogi Berra, and she was always saying these crazy things, like these crazy, hilarious Italian expressions. And uh, when I first met her, I I told my wife, I was like, "Man, your aunt is hilarious. Like, she says these crazy things, man. Do you guys ever think about like putting this down in a book?" And they're like, oh, no, that's how she always talks. And, you know, I started, you know, like she would say these things that were just like really off the wall. It's just like really funny. Um, like, you know, the expression, like it ain't over till the fat lady sings, yes. like things like that. Like just, uh, and you would hear like these expressions, like, wait, did somebody else say that? I'm like, no, that's, she's been saying that for years. I'm like, Jesus, she came up with that on her own or whatever, whatever things she came up with. So I started writing them down and then my wife started writing them down. 
And then as the years went on, we had like upwards of like 90 plus quotes. And so we took the quotes and put them together in a book that we organized and we did it as a way of honoring our, our Auntie Roe. Um, and uh, we put it together in a book called uh, Go Shit in a Hat, Wise Words, Vulgar Expressions, and a little bit of advice from the one and only Auntie Roe. And all the proceeds from the book go towards the Children of St. Jude Charity Hospital. And, um, you know, it's a great way, which was Rose's favorite charity. It's something, it's a, one of our charities as well. So it's a great way of like, every time somebody buys the book on Amazon, you know that it's a great way of honoring her and keeping her words and her life alive. Um, so, and in terms of uh, with pets, my wife and I, you know, obviously there are very big organizations like PETA, you know, which we, you know, we do our best to try to help out with them. But one of the things we try to focus on is just, you know, local specific animal shelters, because a lot of times like big organizations like PETA, I mean, which are great, don't get me wrong, but it's like, there's a lot of people on the front lines that they may not get as many donations as well. So it's like that, like whatever 50 bucks or whatever that you could donate, like that can go a lot further because there's not as much overhead. You don't have to worry about it being spread out through an entire organization. Like you can kind of really donate to like the front line here. I don't know, like my wife and I, we love animals. We've rescued a lot of animals over our life. You know, I've, I've always said this to my wife. Like, I feel like that I was, you know, the alley cat that she rescued, you know? So uh, I've, I've said that even in my wedding vows that, you know, she was the outstretched hand I found in the darkness. So it was, uh, it of all the things- it made it to the vows <laughs> yeah so I, I would say like honest to god like of all the things in this industry like whatever comes whatever goes like the best thing that ever happened to me is like i would have never met my wife if i wasn't in this industry because she was an she's an actress she's also a director you know she started getting into voiceover herself so um like all that stuff like i never would have met her if i wasn't in this industry if i went into any other field if i would have just stayed and just let this thing inside of me just like just live inside of me and I would have been stayed in customer service or whatever the hell I was doing, you know, I never would have met her. And so for me, it's like everything after this is cream cheese. Meant, you know? to, be. Meant to be. That's amazing. But thank you for your support because animals, you know, they are vulnerable and they, people don't realize most of them are smaller than us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> People don't, people, people don't realize the big ones are out in the wild guys. Right. Right than us you have to keep it into perspective but it's tough um yeah you do what you can i mean that's the thing is that that's all any of us can do it's like you kind of you do what you can and um even if it's not you know even if it's not necessarily something financial even if it's something where you can you can foster an animal you know you can certainly you know we've done that as well where it's like you know like maybe we can't take on another dog right now, but we can give a dog a home for a couple of months until they find a new home for it. Lost. You know? Yeah. So it's like, you, you do what you can. So I'm just saying is that it's, I, I just, I just want to emphasize, like it's not necessarily all about the dollars and cents because we're all trying to pay our con ed bill and the economy that we're all in today. What happened like over the weekend, didn't like one of the major banks, you know, in the United States, like close. Oh. So it's like, yeah. That was something that had happened recently that I don't know if the news reached the UK, but there was like a huge bank that just shut down. Wow. So it's like, you know, every like it's it's a sign of the times. Like when a bank is not doing well, it's not, it doesn't look good. So, you know, it's like you, people are thinking about that and you're like, well, you know, I have my own, I, I have my own fires I have to put out. I understand like we all do, but, you know, whatever you can do, even if it's just fostering, even if it's volunteering, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the dollars and the cents. Exactly. Yeah. As we're talking about animals, the cats just come. <laughs> she, she's like, are you talking about me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear her now. Hello. Oh, Chris, that's hilarious. But I want to say a huge thank you because I have to say I learned a lot from the other side, you know, from not me. When I say the other side, it's it always sounds like media. I'm actually dead. That's the, that's the plot twist. This whole time I'm dead. We're and just... I've done an amazing job. If that was the case, you did an amazing job. I've I've actually died like 20 years ago. I'm with Norman right here. Amazing job coming through. 
But no, right. I've, I've really learned a lot about how comedians work. Because we just, we turn on the telly and we watch and we see people tell jokes and we laugh and we get our fill, but we don't know what goes on on the inside. And it was when Robin Williams died um, that people, I think, really started to realize, wait, hang on, there's a whole nother wall. It's almost yeah. like a fourth wall behind there where you really don't know someone. So, yeah. yeah. You know, this, like I said, there's, and obviously I don't want to speak for all comedians. I'm just really kind of more speaking for myself, but you know, there is a real, there is a hypersensitivity that's there more so than I think what people realize. And I think that's where, where a lot of the comedy comes from is because you feel things so deeply. Um, I think, you know, I think most people might look at somebody that's a comedian and say, Oh, this guy's just a cynic. He's just negative. And it's, um, it's the opposite. Like even underneath that cynicism, there's still that hope. Like, yeah, but I, I hope it's going to work out. You know, I hope it does. But then, like that that cynical part, because you're so hypersensitive and you've been wounded so deeply and so many times, that's how it kind of manifests itself through comedy. At least for me, I don't. Wanna, again, I don't want to speak for any other comics. Just speaking for myself. But I know that there are a lot of other comics that approach it that way, where it's just like you're constantly wounded, and like that's the way that it manifests itself. You know, I mean, I, I like what Jerry Seinfeld had said when he says he's very curious about how, like, being a comedian, he views it as almost as like a disorder, like oh. how the disorder manifests itself in so many different, like, people and so many different, like, walks of life where, uh, like, you, you hear about it. Like, you hear that, like, people, like, you could have done anything else and they ended up doing this, you know, and it's like that's the only thing i would say is like the juice has to be worth the squeeze because if you do not love this if you don't love it honestly stay away like just don't even try it um because you gotta love it you have to love it you have to love the ups and you have to love the downs because there's going to be a lot more downs than there are ups especially in the beginning and you know it, you gotta really you have to love it you have to yeah it's your life's work it sounds like it's your life's work. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it's such a great way of connecting with people. It's a great way of like sharing your story, listening to other people's stories. You know, I think, I remember there was something Joe Rogan had said. Um, he had said like, you know, when you're, when you're really connected, you're really doing things just right. The audience and the comedian, it's like you both become passengers on this ship. You know, where even though you're performing in a lot of ways, like there's something that's coming through you that's just bigger than you. And even as the comic, like you're going, you're going on this journey too. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's where you, that's what you kind of feel like is that where, when things are really popping and things are really great. And that's what it felt like during my special. It's like, you felt like, like the audience and you, you guys are going through like this incredible journey together. You know, you guys are like, you know what I mean? Yeah, great. I mean, I can't wait to see it. So viewers, listeners, all of Chris's uh, contacts, the Instagram and the link to the special will be in the show notes as well. So please go and follow Chris. Keep up with him. Watch all. Look out for the new YouTube channel as well that's coming. Now, that is exciting. I should have thought of that. <laughs> that is exciting. You can still do it. You do the UK version. You can still do it. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> With my schedule, I can't add anything else in. Um, but yeah, Chris, thank you so much. Oh, it was a pleasure. Please, thank you so much. And thank you, producer James. Please tell James I said thank you as well. I just appreciate both of you. Thank you so much for having me on. It was so cool to just chat with you and all your listeners. And, you know, hope I give you guys a couple of laughs. Oh, you have, definitely. And I hope you come back. I'd love to hear a bit more about the reaction and how you get yeah out. i can't wait honestly i can't wait to make my way out to the uk there's there's a lot of really great things out there like i know that the uh the fish and chips y'all have out there the clotted cream ice cream i'm, I'm dying to try some tea some oh, high tea yeah. with y'all you know the, yeah. that breakfast you guys have looks very intimidating yeah the, it is yeah don't don't bother with that one thank you have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you soon all right take care bye-bye everybody Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.